Hey everyone, it's Andrew with Manifest Ministries, and I want to talk about the four pillars that the Lord gave me when he gave me this ministry and even leading up to it. Beth and I did some itinerary work for just a little while before he downloaded this into my heart when we were in Alaska, and he's been building upon a ministry um, that centers around a place for him to lay his head. Jesus said when he was here that he had no place to rest, no place to lay his head, that foxes had little dens and uh, but he, the son of man had no place to lay his head. And I said, Lord, I want to provide that for you. And he also tied some verses from Solomon into that, um, where the Solomon laid his head upon her breast, the woman that he loved and he laid with her and the Lord, uh, began to just speak to my heart about a place of intimacy where he could come in his presence would rest and abide. And so I said, Lord, how do we do that? How do we provide uh, an atmosphere that you would enjoy and you linger with the people. Your presence is felt. And it's it's out of a heart really like David's. It said, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build a house for the Lord. And David was very excited about that. He spoke to the prophet Nathan about it. And he said, man, look at, look at where I'm living. You know, we need to do something better for Jesus, for the Lord. So um, that's a lot of what Manifest Ministries is about. The Lord described it as a moving tabernacle, but he did give four pillars that are... Um, uh, intrinsic to whatever we do, the main focus is that we uh, see the Lord manifested, that we experience Jesus, that we encounter Jesus. That's the main thing. And I tell, you know, Cynthia and Beth, if that happens, we've had a successful time in the Lord. Um, if it's more about this person's gifting or this worship or this, then we, I think we failed. Um, but if the Lord appears, if he shows himself and he reveals it, that's the whole point of what we're doing. And then we, we can minister out of that as the Spirit directs, uh, but just basically get out of the way. You know, we, we host him. We take care uh, in the same way you'd have anyone of great importance come into your home. You know, you clean up and you vacuum, you do all that stuff and you get all the food ready. And you, but when they come, the table, the, the stage is theirs. You know, they have the floor. Excuse me. And um, so that's what we try to do. We try to facilitate. Jesus is appearing. And um, so most most of what we do is behind the scenes, the prayer, the times of fasting, times of worship, seeking him, seeking for, so that the, we want the roots to run deep and for there to be the fruit of um, Jesus being there to heal, to deliver, to save, to communicate, to elaborate on himself, to magnify himself. Um, and we had our first glory room a couple of weeks ago and uh, Brenda, my mother-in-law, prophesied um, and as she did about us carrying the glory, it, it sent me to Isaiah 60. And I ministered out of Isaiah 60. And there's a verse there that became the verse of the glory room time. The Lord's given a verse for each department of what we do. And as it expands, they will become more like departments uh, than visions and, and uh, ideas from heaven. They're going to expand. They're going to have feet. They're going to grow. Um, because it is of the Lord. It's an apostolic work from the Lord. All we have to do is obey and cooperate with him. But in Isaiah 60, uh, verse 7, at the end of that verse, it says, They will ascend with acceptance on my altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. God is attracted to himself. He's attracted to where his presence is. He will glorify uh, his glory. So in a place where you're glorifying the Lord, you're, you're, you're giving him splendor and beauty. You're magnifying him. You're making him big. You're putting the attention on him. Heaven is attracted to that. Jesus is drawn to that, and he will come to that. If you, as you draw near to God, he draws near to you. So that is a biblical principle. Whenever you see in Scripture and history where men and women have said, we're going to uh, ascribe beauty to the Lord, we're going to ascribe splendor and majesty and glory, then his glory comes uh, with the full weight of it comes. And I think that there is a measure of it. Uh, that we haven't seen the fullness. I don't know if we could have the all uh, the complete fullness, but it can be much fuller than it's been. And we want that. We want to live in that atmosphere and carry the aroma of heaven wherever we go in the grocery store, in the marketplace, when we're parenting all around us. And the only way that you have that is by living, uh, walking in the spirit, living in a place of the, the abiding spirit within us, but then having encounter after encounter in the Lord from day to day. And we need them both. So four pillars that the Lord gave me as he was downloading Manifest Ministries into my heart and even a little prior to that was revelatory knowledge, prophetic insight, worshipful encounter, 
and creative expression. These four things, we're now we're not, we don't treat these things like columns that were um, boxed in with these, but these are just um, the primary flavors, if you will, of what he's given us to give. Uh, John the Baptist said in um, the Gospel of John that a man can only give what he's received from heaven. So if you haven't received it from the Lord, you really can't give it away. Uh, it's a powerful principle. So we invite people into our journey and into what uh, God has given us. Yeah, in John chapter 3, verse 27, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. Okay, so we only give away what we've received from the Lord. So revelatory knowledge is revelation uh, and, and an eye-opening of what the Lord is speaking of, of his truth and who he is. Uh, Ephesians 1.17, the Apostle Paul prays and he says, Glorious Father, I pray that you would give to them the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him or in the knowledge of Jesus. That they would, another translation, the NLT says that they would know Jesus better. So he released that. And the Lord has given Bethany and I the authority to release that anointing. I had a powerful dream about it, um, dealing with birds of prey. Uh, there were hawks and owls in the dream, and maybe one day I'll share a little bit more on that. Uh, and that's going to turn into an entire far-sighted class that we're going to do dealing just with the prophetic. But when that anointing came, and the Lord uh, touched me twice with it, uh, I could almost turn to any place in the Bible, and there was revelatory knowledge. There was a pouring out, and it, and it hasn't stopped. And I've noticed to sustain it, you just give it away. So the more I, I do these little videos and write on a blog or I give things away when I'm talking to people. I get more. So it's called selfish ambition. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so that's the only reason I'm doing. I want more, Father, from you. Revelation. Um, no, but you give those, you, he gives seed to the sower. So as you're sowing that seed, he enlarges your capacity for seed. He enlarges your ability to uh, receive more from heaven. So that is an anointing. It is a breath. It is a spirit that is breathed out and released. And wherever we speak or wherever we minister, we, we, we pour that out. And we've been speaking it over Monroe and the Amherst uh, area here in Virginia. And um, I believe that people are going to begin to un have understanding that the eyes of their heart are going to be enlightened. They're going to be open. That's the very next thing that uh, Paul prays for them in Ephesians in that first chapter, is that the eyes of their heart would be opened, that they would be illuminated and filled with light. We have to be able to see with the eyes of our heart. So I'm going to read those two verses, actually, in Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. And so uh, in 16, he says, I make mention of you in my prayers all the time. Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, of the translation, say the glorious Father, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that you would know him. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding or the eyes of your heart, okay, the eyes of your hearts, being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him uh, at the, his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave to gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. It is a mouthful, <clears throat> excuse me, a mouthful there that Paul is sharing. Uh, but it begins with the spirit of wisdom and revelation being released upon the people. He's asking God for that. And so we are we release that when we come into an area, when we come to minister, that the eyes of their heart will be opened to all the goodness of heaven, their inheritance, the power, uh, that the word of life would become real to them. And so that is a part of revelatory knowledge, to have revelation, to have our eyes open, to have a showing, a revealing, even a manifesting through the word of life, through the word himself. The second thing is prophetic insight. Prophetic insight enables us to see further than we do, to be farsighted, to be uh, able to look in, into, peer into the future, to have scriptures come to us and have a prophetic understanding of what it is. God is looking to have a prophetic people because he's prophetic. He's looking to have apostolic people because he's apostolic. So what does that mean when people say, oh, they're prophetic? That means that they have a sensitivity 
to um, uh, things of the future, things that pertain to things that have not happened yet, calling those things that are not as though they were. They're speaking forth the vision of God. They are bringing that revelation of heaven pertaining to the future into the earth. Um, and they're wanting to see it fully manifested, fully brought forth into the earth completely. So prophetic insight is that um, some of it's end times. There's a lot of focus on end times. And I'm going to do a little bit of a, oh, just a quick teaching on some of that. Because um, I'll just say this, when we're dealing with end time passages of scripture or passages of scripture that have to do with um, the latter days and end time, sometimes we uh, want to pinpoint a particular time. And there's a cyclical quality to what God does. He's a manifold wisdom. He has a many-sided, varied, many-colored wisdom. So it's rarely just one thing. There are things that God has prophesied that have occurred in history. Uh, when Daniel saw the stone come out of the mountain of that government of God and roll and hit the statue, historically that has happened. He crumbled those empires, and then he began to create an empire, uh, a mountain of his own, another government of his own, the kingdom of God. That historically has happened. But what happens with many prophetic passages is that these things happen uh, many times over on a smaller scale. There are worlds within worlds, ages upon ages, that they're happening um, on a smaller scale. And I'll get into some of that. Ecclesiastes says that what has been will be uh, and it will be again, that there is this continuation, the cycle of what's happening. And it won't be the end of the world. I will say that here. It's only a new beginning. Revelation 22 tells us that there is a new heaven and a new earth. The earth will be remade. It won't be the end of the world. I've heard people say, oh, it's not the end of the world yet. Or we're in the end of the world. And this is all coming on. No, everything has to be redone and remade. And the Lord is going to reign a thousand years in the earth. And it's going to be glorious and powerful. And we have stepped into a golden era that is um, uh, perpetuating those things, accelerating a lot of those things. There will be full growth of both the good and evil. Uh, Jesus is the inception. He's the beginning and the end. He is the summation of all things. All things are made by him and for him. All things are going to have to report to him. Every being is going to report to him, whether in the earth or over the earth or under the earth. And he is Lord. In the earth, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Every one of them will. So there is coming a revelation of who he is that no one can deny. Um, but in God's wisdom, he made himself immortal, eternal, invisible to the natural eye, so that you would have to use the key of faith to access the realm of heaven. Faith is not make-believe. Faith is access. Faith enables us to step into a realm that we can't see. It's invisible to us, but it's very real, and it's more real than this realm because it's going to impact this realm, and this realm is passing away. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word by no means will pass away. Jesus said that. So uh, the living word and what he speaks is eternal, and so you can build on it. When the Lord says something, you can build on it. So that's some of prophetic insight, understanding what the Lord has coming, having vision. Without a vision, the people cast off restraint. Without vision, people perish. Uh, I see that a lot. I see in churches, there's no vision. There's no direction. They don't know where they're going. They don't know what their purpose is. God is very specific in his house. Uh, I don't know why we see specificity in the natural world, but we don't see it more in the church. If you go to a doctor, you wouldn't go to an eye doctor to work on your knee because that doctor has... Um, qualifications, very specific ones pertaining to the kind of work that he or she does. You know, anything pertaining to your body, and we give so much attention to that. The doctor says, oh, I've got to take this pill at this time, but I can't take it at this time. I got to do it like that. And we, the specifics of it. But when it comes to the church and people talk about apostles and prophets and what the Lord is doing, they say, why do they have to be called that? Or why are they doing that? Because it's specificity. It's specifics in the kingdom. It's good that we know this. It's good that we know what the Lord is doing. Not that we elevate it above his name or anything else, but those things, um, uh, apostles are there so that the whole church will be apostolic. Pro prophets are there so there's, there's an element of it where everyone becomes prophetic. Pastors are there so that everyone should have pastoral care. There should be some, some um, um, uh, inclination of the heart where people want it to protect others and they want to feed them the word of God. So these are just the sides of Jesus anyway. Jesus gave these gifts in Ephesians 4 uh, because they're aspects of who he is. He, was the, he, was, he is the apostle. He is the prophet, capital P, even the one that Moses prophesied about. He is the evangelist. Um, but these are aspects of who he is, and each one of those are very different. So each one of us should have a prophetic ministry uh, to a degree. It doesn't mean all of us necessarily are, are prophets, 
but there is coming an assimilation, I believe, where we understand that and that some of us are not elevated beyond measure and beyond where the Lord has placed us. So again, prophetic insight. And then uh, the next one is worshipful encounter. Above everything else, we're worshipers. And that doesn't mean music and instrumentation. It means that by our lifestyle, we work as unto the Lord. All that we do, do is unto the Lord. Um, and it's a worshipful lifestyle. And that we encounter him. We believe that he inhabits the praises of his people. We believe that when you sing unto the Lord, he provides a new song. Um, greet one another in hymns, songs, and spiritual songs. Sing to the Lord a new song. He inhabits the praise. He comes and sits in it. He comes and rests in the praise of his children and the adoration of his people. You've seen this over and over again in, in, in scripture and in history. And, um, and have encounters where you just begin to lift him up. So we're worshipers more than anything else. I consider myself a worshiper more than a worship leader. My wife is geared more in a way where she's an actual worship leader. I believe she's anointed specifically for that as a worship leader and seer. But I'm a worshiper. And uh, I'm one that, uh, you know, uh, even when I started playing guitar and stuff, I knew that I was not going to be a, a guitar virtuoso. I knew that I just started to play with the Lord, play unto the Lord, excuse me, in the secret place and um, uh, and play with him. <laughs> I mean, I'm playing with the Lord. He's giving me these songs. I'm not just coming up with them on my own. I, I don't have any idea. Some of the chords I play, I have no idea where they came from. I, I don't even know if they're chords or not. Um, so I am playing with the Spirit, with the Lord. That, that's, a, that's a funny little mistake there, but it's not. It's true. Uh, so worshipful encounter. The last is creative expression. Uh, we have a very creative gr group. My wife and I are creatives. We're artists. Um, and Cynthia is creative in business and in her own right and wisdom and in what the Lord gives her. She, she would say she's, she doesn't think she's that creative, but she is. Um, and in her ingenuity and going forward and, and as a leader and in, in, in the power of faith, uh, Cynthia moves in a, with a strong gift of faith. So uh, just like with any sports team, this, the team is going to take on the attributes of the coaches. So if you have a football team and the coach focuses on defense, uh, he's a def he was a primary defensive player, then the team may be more defensive. They're going to they're going to beef up their defense. They're going to try to stop the run and stop the pass. Uh, but we're artistic. So uh, creative expression, those those scriptures um, stand out to us. Exodus 31 is the first time anyone's filled with the spirit. Joseph it's mentioned by Pharaoh that Joseph was filled with the Spirit, but the Scriptures don't say that. The first time that it says the Lord filled someone, it's in Exodus 31, and they're artisans. Bezalel and Aholiah were artisans, and Moses, the Lord told Moses to um, have them work on the tabernacle, the most ambitious art project ever, uh, at, at least up to that point, and even beyond that, to have the meeting place for you and God, to have um, this tabernacle, this tent of meeting, this place of, of skin where you come and you meet with the Lord and, and have the sins of the people dealt with. It's, it's, you can't create something more important than that. This is a shadow of what Jesus was going to accomplish on the cross. So to have artists work on this, work in various metals and, and, and tapestry and fabric and color was crucial. So artists are very important. The New Testament speaks a little bit about um, uh, poets. Paul mentioned different poets in, in the New Testament letters. The first poem maybe that's ever been definitely in scripture is uh, Genesis 8.22. Uh, As the earth endures seed time and harvest cold in winter. Um, I'm going to read that. Let me read that verbatim. So Genesis 8.22. Really great. It's the first time you hear a, a, a poem in the Lord and when you translate it into the English it even has a little bit of a rhythmic pattern to it. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Um, so when I when I was saved, when Jesus came and saved me, I had been an artist since I was a child. You know, my mother's an artist, and I get it from my granddad's side. On uh, I mean, my granddad on my dad's side. So I had a lot of creativity running through my veins. But in the church, I didn't see a lot. And in the Bible, I was struggling. But the Lord opened up passages like Exodus 31 and Genesis 8:22 and other places where you say, yes, the artists of creatives are very important. The very first passage of scripture in the beginning, God made, God created. The very first thing that happens is that God demonstrates himself, uh, his creative power, and he shows himself as creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth is the very first 
passage in all 66 books of the Bible. I read just a little bit of Exodus 31. Real fast. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze, and cutting jewels for setting and carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. And I, indeed I, have appointed with him Aholiab, uh, the son of Ahishamech, of the tribe of Dan, and I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans that they may make all that I have commanded you, the tabernacle of meeting, the ark of the testimony, and the mercy seat that is on it, and all the furniture of the tabernacle. And then he continues on with the utensils and garments that are part of the tabernacle. Ambitious art project, just incredible uh, um, uh, art project is what it was. Um, but uh, creatives and artists are very important. They're very dear to the Lord's heart. They're mi we're misunderstood a lot in the church. And a lot of times we're just one little small part of the church. It, uh, the, it took forever for the church to warm up, um, some churches to warm up to banners during dancing. And then, oh, well, they can paint over in the corner, but they can't paint this time. They have to paint during this time. They can't do it. So it became, it's like, um, so we're still learning how to incorporate these things because in heaven, the worship is not restricted like that. It's not compartmentalized. It's just flow. Um, there's been testimony of people who've gone into heaven and they've seen the flowers singing. There's actual music that's coming, musical notes that's coming out of the flowers. And it, they're, they're, they're demonstrating notes or they're singing and, and playing music in notes that we have not heard, in a scale we have not heard, It'd be you know past what we understand. There's colors that we haven't seen yet. So it's it's amazing. So if we if we begin to touch some of that and bring some of that here on earth as it is in heaven, that's the apostolic mandate, if you will. That's a, a apostolic call is to have on earth as it is in heaven. What Moses saw in the tabernacle in heaven, he took the blueprints of that and made it in the earth. That's that's one aspect of what an apostle does. Um, and and Moses was a great patriarch. Uh, uh, in God's kingdom and in his house. Um, and he did that with great wisdom. But um, as we do that, a, a part of that is, is bringing that creative aspect into the earth. So number one, revelatory knowledge. Number two, prophetic insight. Number three, worshipful encounter. And number four, creative expression. Um, and I bless you guys with that. If anyone watching this, you said, man, I, I like the idea of that. I want to incorporate some of that. Pursue the Lord on that. You know, talk to your leaders about that. If you are a leader in your fellowship, say, Lord, do we, we need another flair. We need more of this. I think we need more creative. We need more color. Seek him in that. Um, there's Artists are as varied as there are trees or birds. I mean, there's so many different kind of creatives. And we go through different phases. Um, just like Pablo Picasso went through his blue phase. There's artists that go through different phases. But most artists have something that's a calling card of theirs. I create what I just simply call windows now. They're these 36 by 36 paintings. Um, and I wait upon the Lord and uh, and I'll draw little diagrams and I pray that they touch people. I pray they lead them into a, a place of communion with him. Um, and they're meant to be those windows for that. The anointing that I pray they carry would be stronger than the, the artistic expertise that's demonstrated in them. Uh, I think they're, they're very simplistic in a way, but his anointing isn't. Um, when you talk about words, there most words are just syllables and sounds and put together, you know. But when God's speaking them and when they're anointed, when they're their spirit, Jesus said that what I say is spirit and truth. So the vehicles and things we use to communicate creative ideas may be crude sometimes or limited, but the anointing never is. And the Lord will touch uh, anything that is glorifying him. He will glorify the house of his glory, as it says in Isaiah 60, I believe it's chapter 7. So I just bless you guys, and I thank you um, for allowing me to share my heart for a second and the four pillars of Manifest Ministries.